make this accessible for everyone. Nice to see you all. Oh, DeAndre's here, that's so great. Okay. Uh, Alisa, Althea, and Dave, do you mind keeping letting people in while I get going? Okay, thank you, thank you. Okay, um, welcome, welcome, welcome. It's so nice to see so many squares here in Zoom. Um, it should be the case that a transcript is available <clears throat> if you want to turn that on. And also we are recording so that we can um, make this available for folks who aren't able to be here. Oh, I'm gonna turn on chat as well. Um, okay, I am Katie Dichter. I am a faculty librarian at Seattle Central. This is the first cozy of the 22-23 academic year. Very exciting. Um, COSI stands for Conversations on Social Issues, um, in case it's your first time here. Uh, <clears throat> typically, I put out the COSI schedule for the whole quarter at around this time or before, but things are still tentative. Um, I will publish the full schedule at some point, um, hopefully very soon. So uh, yeah, let's get started. Oh, also today I am both the facilitator and a presenter, which I've never had that dual role, but we're just gonna go with it. Okay, so first a land acknowledgement. We acknowledge the unceded land we live on as the home of the Coast Salish people, the traditional home of all tribes and bands within the Duwamish, Suquamish, Tulalip, and Muckleshoot nations. I encourage non-Native members of our community to consider what it means to be guests on this land and to actively acknowledge the Duwamish tribe by paying real rent. Let me grab the real rent link and put it in the chat. Oh, there are really a lot of a lot of folks showing up. This is great. Okay, here is a link to real rent. <clears throat> Um, and labor acknowledgement. We remember that our country is built on the labor of enslaved people who were kidnapped and brought to the United States from the African continent. And we recognize the continued contribution of their survivors. We also acknowledge all unpaid caregiving labor and immigrant labor, including voluntary, involuntary, trafficked, forced and undocumented peoples who contributed to the building of our country and who continue to serve within our labor force. Okay, wowie. Okay, I um, also wanna say many, 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 many thanks to the librarians before me who built up the COSI program. That's Kelly McHenry and Kimberly Tate Malone. Um, Kimberly is now a full-time librarian at North. So still in the district and that's great for everyone. Okay. Um, Today, I am joined in this conversation that is called No Tone Policing, No Shaming, No Canceling by my librarian colleagues, Dave Ellenwood, Althea Lazaro, and Elisa Jackson Porter. So we'll get started. All right, so welcome everyone. Again, my name is Dave Ellenwood. I'm a librarian at Central. <clears throat> And I get the privilege of uh, introducing us a little bit here. So um, we're gonna talk about uh, online communication, things like social media and email. Um, so as we all know, these systems are great. They facilitate communication, community building and organizing. Um, they, and they can also cause problems of miscommunication and disconnection. And as our title kind of um, indicated, we wanted to talk about certain problems that can arise like tone policing, shaming and canceling. So uh, I'm gonna go over our agenda real quick. So our agenda is I'm gonna do some defining of those terms from our title to start us out. And then we'll kind of give an example from the librarian's perspective of fighting for an all faculty email list. And then we will mostly have conversation about online communication, 
um, and we have some discussion uh, questions for you all, which in which we'll identify benefits and challenges, and um, and then we'll try to generate some some solutions and ways that we can uh, improve these systems together. So, and we're really trying to stick to the conversation aspect of our uh, of the title of the COSI series. So it'll be a lot of conversation with y'all. So glad there's many of you here. Um, so to start with definitions, let me pull up some slides. And if I'm missing anything from the chat, I can't, I'm having a hard time watching that right now. So anyone chime in if uh, I need to be interrupted. So. Give me one second while I pull, pull up our PowerPoint. Okay, I'm gonna try to make the leap into presentation mode. So if it goes awry, just let me know. Okay, I'm there. I hope you all are here with me. So uh, starting with some definitions. Um, our first uh, part of our title was tone, no tone policing, right? So what is tone policing? And we're gonna use the definition from uh, Idioma Oluo's, so you wanna talk about race. So tone policing is when someone, usually the privileged person in a conversation or situation about oppression, shifts the focus of the conversation from the oppression being discussed to the way it is being discussed. Tone policing prioritizes the comfort of the privileged person in the situation over the oppression of the disadvantaged person. This is something that can happen in a conversation, but can also apply to critiques or entire civil rights organizations and movements. Most damagingly, tone policing places prerequisites on being heard and being helped. And as my colleague Katie Dichter kind of mentioned as we were talking about this, tone policing can go beyond this and it's really an issue of power. So who has the uh, power to set the tone and this can be in any sort of um, place in our society. So in the classroom, for example, teachers have a lot of power to set the tone and police tone. Um, administrators have a lot of power to set tone and police that for students, faculty, staff as well, things like that. Uh, so no shaming is our other, another term. So shaming as defined by Stacey uh, Haynes in the politics of trauma, somatics, healing and social justice is, so shame is the pervasive sense that we are wrong, not that we did something wrong. Right, so in this sense, shaming is the act of negatively judging a person's worth or belonging based on their actions. So shaming, and then lastly, canceling, maybe our more complicated of our three terms. We don't have a definitive definition in this, um, but we are pulling from Adrian Marie Brown's uh, We Will Not Cancel Us and Other Dreams of Transformative Justice. So I'm gonna take a little pastiche of different quotes from her and uh, maybe that'll give us a sense of what canceling is. So Adrian Marie Brown says, canceling is punishment and punishment does not stop the cycle of harm, not long-term. Sometimes there are consequences, loss of job, community, reputation, platform. Sometimes there's just derision and calls for disappearance. Uh, about knee-jerk about knee call-outs, she said, uh, say those who cause harm or mess up or disagree with us cannot change and cannot belong. They must be eradicated. The bad things in the world cannot change. We must disappear the bad until there is only good left. Um, and, and then beyond that, um, another, I think we have to draw attention in canceling to uh, power again. So, so much of the, the social mores and boundaries of our society are set by people in power. And canceling often happens when those, uh, when those boundaries are, are crossed, right? But also um, Adrian Marie Brown is not saying that um, people who are being abused or, or um, have less power and doing kind of call outs or, or canceling attempts uh, in order to stop abuse in, the, in its tracks. She's not saying that that's a bad thing. She's saying that a lot of the pylons that come after someone trying to do that uh, is, is a problem. So um, I'm gonna leave it at that with my definitions and toss it back over to Katie. Thanks, Dave. Uh, I 
just recovered from being booted out of Zoom and coming back in. Hopefully no one noticed that. Um, and uh, I'm back. <laughs> okay, so um, I want to move on and talk a little bit about um, our kind of college and district context for the conversation. So we want to use um, as kind of a case study, something called the conversations list. And um, the conversations list is a faculty email tool, an online communication tool where faculty can subscribe to this list. And then we can all email each other or email everyone else who is in the list. And it functions very much like any other listserv or like email um, in that we, uh, we have open communication. There's a like button um, so you can like other people's emails or posts. Um, you can reply all, et cetera. Uh, but I think an important thing to know is a little bit of history about the, the listserv itself, which is that um, our previous chancellor, Chancellor Sean Pan, um, in 2017, so five years ago, um, implemented a district-wide email policy called Policy 281, and it revoked the privilege of faculty and staff to email um, large uh, groups within the email system. So in other words, before 2017, we could email everyone on the central campus, we could email everyone in the district, um, and then we could reply all to any email. And Chancellor Pan, through Policy 281, revoked that privilege. Um, this also coincided with the Trump presidency, where we saw at the national level a lot of constricting of speech in the press and in different educational organizations. Um, so restriction of, of speech and also organizing uh, in a very kind of totalitarian way. So um, a couple, well, let's see, spring 2019, librarians in the district um, wanted to fight this and we wanted our email privileges back. So um, we visited the Board of Trustees several times. We did a lot of research about nationally, what do these privileges look like? Uh, and we met with the chancellor right in the beginning of COVID, I remember, because it was like my first Zoom ever. Um, and then eventually, uh, somewhat undemocratically, <laughs> the chancellor was like, OK, you can have this privilege back, but only faculty. Um, and I'm not gonna actually like explain why I did it or anything like that. Um, so still now staff don't have the same privileges. If you wanna email everyone on campus, you have to like ask your boss or something like that. Um, but we do have this listserv called faculty conversations. Um, and over the several years that we've had this list, there have been, um, there have been instances of shaming and tone policing um, and canceling that we've seen. So we aren't going to call out any specific instances or names. And we ask that no one here does either because we really wanna keep this at the level of like the communication tool and how it serves us. Okay, I think I'll, I think I'll stop there. Um, <clears throat> I'm excited to see so many librarians here because you all have some institutional memory on why the librarians were the ones who decided to take up this fight to get our communication privileges back. Um, can everybody hear me okay? I should have checked that. Great. Okay. Um, and so any of you who remember these conversations, chime in. My recollection is that at district librarian meetings, we were talking over those couple of years between when our privileges were revoked and we were given an opt-in list serve um, rather than an opt-out list serve or the ability to just email each other. And those structural pieces matter quite a bit in how usable that tool was. What I remember discussing was that we noticed changes in our information environment that were very negative. And I think as librarians, often we think of ourselves as having some responsibility for our information environment, assisting in the healthy flow of communication and keeping an eye on the effects of um, throttling of communication or bad 
bad communication is a wrong way of saying it, but things like misinformation, disinformation, the uh, information environment being flooded with, with um, information that has harmful effects. And so we were kind of watching this happen and noticed um, a decline in communication college-wide. Students didn't know as much about what was going on in the college because faculty and staff didn't know as much about what was going on in the college. Things like art shows, COSI events, um, attendance at college-wide events were declining. There were some instances of really pretty scary, disruptive behavior that was happening on campus that people didn't know about. Dangerous incidents in classrooms. I was on campus once when um, a live streamer came on campus and was harassing students and there was no way to let everyone know that that was happening. So there were dangerous incidents um, and uh, diminishment in our ability to organize through our union and have conversations about workplace issues um, and a, a diminished sense of overall community, a lack of cohesion, people not knowing what was going on with their colleagues, the triumphs, the trials, you know, all of that, we just all felt more siloed and alienated. And so I think that um, as librarians, we're taking in this conversation a notion that the open, healthy flow of information and communication is a public good, while acknowledging that um, our information environment can get very complicated and that there are both structural, um, technical pieces related to that and also cultural normative pieces to that. Um, and that both of those things play a role in kind of the, the health and flourishing of um, information environments. That was lovely, Althea, thank you so much. So we wanna move into um, hearing from you all. Oh, you know what? We had talked yesterday about maybe putting folks in breakout rooms if there were over 20 people. Is that a thing? Are we are we doing that? Yes, okay. Co-host, someone else wanna make those breakout rooms or you want me to do it? Okay, well, I'm gonna give the prompt. So uh, yeah. Okay, the first thing that we would like you to chat about and that we'll chat together about um, is, and I think like Althea alluded to this a little bit, but like really within the context of, of a librarian brain, but um, what are the benefits of these online communication tools like a faculty listserv, but also like Twitter, like Instagram, like Facebook, like TikTok, um, places where you can openly communicate with lots and lots of other people. What are the benefits and what are the challenges? So those are our first prompts. I'll put them in the chat. And I think we're ready to go into breakout rooms. And maybe we'll do like 10 minutes or so and then come back together. We wanna hear, hear back some brilliance from what's going on in the breakout rooms. I made it so that you choose your room. So it's not gonna automatically put you into the breakout room. You'll have to opt into it. I hope that's okay, guys. That's great, thank you. Are folks seeing that? Yep. Great. Hi. Somehow I don't see that. Do 
draw the breakout room? I can um, move you into a room if that's helpful. Yeah, sure. Either one. Yeah, any room will be fine. Thank you. Yeah, you got it. And I'll do the same for you, Charlotte. Me also. This is Judy. Thanks. Thanks, Judy. I'll do you too. To anyone who's just joined us, um, we are currently in breakout rooms. So you can choose a breakout room to join and have some conversation with, um, with others about the benefits and challenges of online communication tools. I wonder if the students in Anna's class are talking together. They are. Oh, nice. And we're just letting the other folks chill if they need a break.
Okay, how about now? Phew, I do not know what's going on with my audiovisual equipment. <laughs> Okay, did we say 10, 10 minutes? That was 12.28, I think. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm gonna click close because it gives a minute. How's that sound? Okay. Oh, um, can someone, do, should I facilitate out of this or can someone else do it? You mean their answers? Yeah. Um, I can help out with that. Thanks. Oh, you're going to at least set their responses. <laughs> we made up a word yesterday, Althea. Hi, Tish, and anyone else who just joined us, we're waiting for folks to come back from their breakout rooms in 15 seconds. All right, welcome back everyone. I hope you had some fruitful conversations. Um, I'll, I'll be taking some notes um, during our discussion the rest of the hour um, and we'll post those to um, the COSI um, website shortly. So tell me, what are some benefits of um, mass, online communication tools. Anyone can raise their hand or? Yeah, you can raise hand electronically or your hand hand or you can also <laughs> put stack in the chat like that to indicate that you want to talk. Z, go ahead. Hi. Um, so in general, mass communications can be extremely fast for the benefits. Uh, it reaches out to hit a lot of people very quickly. Um, the problem with them that I generally see is information overload. The value of communications diminishes rapidly. If you are inundated with 30 messages, then none of them are important. Um, and so having access to be able to communicate to others rapidly and having access to a lot of people is very good. But if you can use like, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, in some web development stuff, things like monkey, like those monkey, the lists of, for emails where you just send one message to everybody, 
it spams everyone and very quickly people stop paying attention to those and all of a sudden you need to like in marketing they're constantly trying to figure out how they can get some like an interesting hook just to get someone to even look at those emails so if we're discussing safety things then it needs to be something that is primarily used for safety procedures um, otherwise that people won't know that um, they need should look at this email if it's used for anything thank you z thanks for getting us started cody i see you in stack yeah uh well we uh we had a great discussion about uh the values of unfettered communication particularly as it relates to safety we uh we had some lived experiences of uh, vandalism, car break-ins at, at Central, and having the means to communicate that out, um, you know, uh, uh, would benefit everyone, right? Um, so leading with safety as a primary consideration. Uh, I talked, um, I was about to, uh, talk about my experience. And so my lived experience when um, that predated the uh, 2017 uh, policy and procedure on email use is there was a very um, contentious thread that was really hurtful when the parents of Mike Brown, who had their son killed by a Ferguson police officer, uh, was invited to speak at North Seattle College. And it was very valuable for the community to hear that experience from the parents. And so the really harmful thing that I felt and saw was um, some individuals using that to all campus email to spread sensitive, uh, insensitive and hurtful remarks. And that thread went on for a long time because the hurt is deep. And, and um, you know, it, it, there, we have gone through a racial reckoning on top of the pandemic in 2020 as well. And um, lots of conversations could be had about that. Um, and what, when we get to the question of, you know, um, you know, canceling or tone policing or shaming. I think that it's it. Let's let's come back to the center principle, which is safety, right? And I was a part of the chancellor's Chancellor Pan's working group when um, he commissioned Vice Chancellor of HR Dave Blake to form an advisory group. And uh, my dual hat that I wear is that I'm also the president of the professional staff union. And so my constituency um, primarily wanted to focus on work during core work hours. And so we supported the um, opt-in Canvas conversation because we saw that there was a balancing test where if we did have a safety issue, to bring forward, we can go to an administrator with that. And uh, we you know, see that come out in forms of district communication. So in my, my experience being a party to that, and then also hearing the uh, faculty librarians concerns at the board of trustees, I, I remember that meeting and a lot of how these policies and procedures get um, ultimately sent up to the board of, of, of trustees for approval is it usually accompanies some executive sponsor or proposed revision before it gets on the board of trustees agenda. I mean, I myself have something that I'm going to put on the board of trustees agenda for uh, November because, um, I mean, as I said, safety is a, is a primary issue as well.
I, I, Elisa and I are in the same office, so I can hear her typing furiously. So I'm going to facilitate the next round so she can keep doing that. Cody, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Um, I, I love that we have some like really different experiences from our different positions that we get to contribute to this conversation. Anybody else on stack? While I'm waiting, I wanna um, I wanna mention an aspect of what Cody brought up, which is um, opt in and opt out lists. And so, what was created to replace the ability to email all was an opt in list serve. And what we asked for, or what or I should say, what we eventually got, and I think it was one of the things that we proposed, was an opt out list serve. And the difference between those things was quite significant because we were finding that um, part time employees and new employees didn't know how to opt in to the communication structure that had been created. But um, opting out allowed people, if they didn't want to be on the receiving end of that kind of information that was communicated in that particular way, they could opt out opt out, um, but the default was that everyone was enrolled in that communication to begin with. So it's, it's interesting to think about those kind of structural differences and the effect that they have on the information environment. Yeah, I'm gonna also jump in and, um, and say thanks to Cody for giving that context. Um, and I think when I, when I consider that piece of our college's history, I think back on um, how we could have navigated that a little bit more adeptly, I think. And I think that's the spirit of this conversation because it wasn't the last time that something like that has taken place. We do still have very much constricted freedom to communicate in those ways. Um, so the librarian fight for this faculty tool um, that level of, of communication that we were before. Um, yeah. And I think that, yeah, I guess that's all I'll say. Thank you for giving that context. Facilitators, do you think it makes sense to move on to the question of like, um, community norms? Yeah. Um, so one of the things that we talked about when we were preparing for this was the emotional experience of being kind of deluged with information, like Z said, especially when that information is like highly emotional or um, very invested in the complications of power. Um, and we discussed some kind of personal management techniques for dealing with that, the, um, the kind of physiological effect that being a part of those communications can have. Um, but then we also talked about ways that we can all be um, responsible for the health of communication. And so one of the things that we thought about as um, being in kind of conflict not really, but kind of the is the no tone policing and the no shaming, right? Because when we say no shaming, it feels like a form, it could feel like a form of tone policing, right? That you can only speak in particular ways, but something that we wanted to think about um, and that we've been particularly inspired by in the world of transformative justice um, is expanding our imagination around what our possibilities are. And so if we set as our norms that communication is a public and community good, that we don't shame each other. People aren't bad, even when their behaviors or actions are negative, that people don't, we don't, um, we don't cancel people because we don't want people to cease to exist, right? And we also don't tone police when we have members of our community who've been deeply harmed and need to put a stop to abuse. Um, and abusive behaviors, right? So if we take all four of those things as being necessary to healthy communication, what are our options for creating a healthy communication environment? And that's kind of a complicated question. Um, I know Dave has an example of um, a transformative justice scholar who's got some thoughts around this. And then do we wanna do breakout groups for the last few minutes of the conversation? 
Cool. Dave, you want to bring that up? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Let me bring that my set of slides back up. Why is it always a little complicated? Okay. There we go. I hope folks can see that. And I'll shall I just read through it real quick and give a little context. Okay, so this is a post from Miriam or Miriam Kaba, who, as Althea said, is kind of a really well-known scholar um, on transformative justice. Uh, one of our research assistants at the library actually found this, Leslie Garrett, um, this online for us. So this is a Facebook post from Miriam um, talking about how we might deal with um, sort of issues of abuse, harm online in online situations. So I'll just read through it. This is from 2018. Uh, she says, I share this because we all really need to figure out how to navigate this shit on social media much more ethically. A very short primer for navigating harm while on social media. When you see on social media that someone has hurt or is accused of hurting a person uh, in your communities or who you know, you can slow down and ask yourself, how am I feeling? How does this, br uh, what does this bring up for me about prior experiences? What does the person who was hurt want? What are my motivations when I'm posting about this on social media? And then at the end, she says, if you don't actually know either party, you are not obligated to offer public comments, especially about issues that you may have no or very little information about. It is unfair to be compelled to respond in a public way if you are uncomfortable, confused, or otherwise unprepared to comment. Virtue signaling is not conducive to community accountability or transformative justice. And I can post that into the chat too, if that would be useful to folks. I'm gonna open up those breakout rooms again and maybe have like, a, Katie, what do you think? A five minute conversation in those breakout rooms? That sounds good. Do you mind just repeating the prompt? Yeah, thank you for asking for that. Um, the prompt was, um, what are some community management techniques that are um, structural or cultural around creating healthy communication environments? And I've opened those rooms. Chat. What's that? I'm just writing that in the chat for everyone. Thank you. Maybe another way to put it is, how do we take care of each other in these online spaces? Ooh, I love that, Elisa. Me too, Elisa. Can we send that to everybody? Yes. So okay. good. Those are in the chat. So jump into a breakout room, and we'll come back in five-ish minutes. People moved into their breakout rooms really quickly. That's so great. I see a few people who weren't um, in here, I think, when we open the breakout rooms again. Let me know if you need me to move you into a room. I won't do it without your consent.
Okay, it looks like everyone's back. Um, as Katie mentioned in the chat, uh, Kosi ends at 1250, but we are gonna stay till one to keep discussing. So if, if you need to leave, that's okay, but feel free to stay. Um, <clears throat> So the question again was, what are some community management techniques around healthy communication environments? How do we take care of ourselves and others uh, and each other in these spaces? Um, does anyone wanna report out some of the thoughts from their group? Um, I'd love to have someone new speak. That's a deep, uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, I, I can share, you know, just some of the things that, that we talked about. Um, you know, Dave, I, I'm, I'm so glad you shared that post um, from Miriam Kaba, who's like, yeah, just such an inspiring thinker and activist. And, um, and it reminded me that, you know, oftentimes we're using um, these platforms, like I'm a faculty member, so I can speak about faculty conversations. Um, we oftentimes use these as a way to, to discuss with our colleagues institutional harms that have happened right um but sometimes in sharing these things on on these you know more anonymous platforms we end up doing harm ourselves right and one of the ways one of the ways that we might end up doing harm or doing more harm is by naming individuals so i think that you know we we have to figure out or come up with some ground rules together as a community, like maybe just, you know, for faculty, as far as conversations go about like, yeah, how we how we make sure that when we're using these platforms to share harm and 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 publicize institutional harm that we're also not doing harm. Um, to our colleagues and our colleagues across, you know, across employee classification lines because staff and administrators are our colleagues as well. Great point, Deepa. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, DeAndre, did you want to jump in too, or? Oh, I see Shireen on stack. So let's let's start with Shireen. Yeah, and then. Thanks. Um, just one thing that um, had, has occurred to me over the course of this and previous conversations is, as far as community norming, I feel like we have moved over the last several years <clears throat> as a community. Um, from a model that um, focused on this idea of presuming positive intent. Um, and it seems like we've moved away from that model into more of a focus on preventing harm. And, um, and what I've noticed in that shift is partly, it feels like that's a little bit, the, the shift is away from the personal responsibility of the person listening to the communication and onto the responsibility of the person speaking or sharing. And I feel like that can actually be a way to um, limit honest conversation and also put the speaker in a position to have to consider all of the possible ways that that content can be perceived. And it's pretty impossible to do that, right? It's pretty impossible to, um, from a philosophical standpoint, consider all the different ways information can be um, perceived or processed by people. Um, so I guess I just want to throw out um, why we have uh, sort of moved away from that idea of presuming positive intent, because I feel like um, that that seems like generally um, a model that has value. I'm sure there are people who have different perspectives on that. But um, I think if we try and remember that most of us um, have the same goals, ultimately, um, maybe different ways of getting to those goals. Um, it's an opportunity to have more constructive criticism. And also, I guess, along those same lines, I feel like <clears throat> we as participants in a community need to take personal responsibility for our own feelings and how we manage them. I feel like that's part of what it just means to be um, an adult in any community. So those are just some thoughts that come to my mind. And, and Dave, the only thing that I, uh, thank you Shireen for sharing, the only thing that I want to just echo what uh, Dr. Deepa in this conversation is very, very helpful. I think it's a systematic uh, conversation too, as well as we try to think about how communication in general uh, works. So just grateful to be in this space. Thank you, librarians.
Thank you for that, DeAndre and Shireen. And I think, you know, as I look at sort of transformative justice models, I think what it's saying is that everyone has responsibility from, from all ends of it. Um, and the thing that I like about the uh, prevent harm prevention stuff is that people who are experiencing harm, just they need to stop it in the moment. And that's, I think that that makes a lot of sense. Um, people posting things in various formats have to think about the potential impacts. Um, maybe not every single potential impact. I see what you're saying, the sort of absurdity of that, but um, it should be some part of, they do have some responsibility, I think. And um, then the, the community has responsibility as well. So in that transformative justice model, everybody has responsibility. Uh, anyone else want to chime in from their group? Erin is on stack. Oh, sorry, I didn't see that. Erin, go for it. Hey, thanks. I just wanted to say, I think one th one thought I had, um, thinking about what Althea shared, the I think there were four principles that you were talking about. And as I was listening, I found that both really hopeful and also I feel some sense of ambivalence. And I feel like it's related to what I hear Shireen and Deepa sharing also. And that I think that we all <laughs> we all know there are folks that that are incredibly thoughtful about what they bring to those shared threads. Like they they think hard about how they articulate things. Many of those people are in this shared space right now. Um, and there also will always be people that are not as thoughtful in how they how they join in, virtue signaling, I think, you know, from the post you shared, Dave, like, um, and, and so, but I feel like it, it feels hopeful to me, the, the idea in like the Adrienne Marie Brown sense of creating a critical mass of people that are agreeing to work on like reflecting those types of principles and the way we bring our presence to those spaces, I think can have an, an impact on um, how folks that are, that are maybe further out from that core of people um, then begin mirroring that type of behavior in those spaces. And so it feels, it feels like a hopeful direction to me. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Althea, if there's still time, I, you had some really good examples of how you personally um, take accountability for your own your own thoughts and feelings, kind of like what Shireen, Shireen was talking about. Oh, I'm sorry, Anna. Maybe Anna go first, or Thank Ariel, you. and then and then <laughs> Althea. Uh, I, well, for us, so we were doing for that answer of like the how do we take care of each other in this online spaces. We were thinking because we're obviously we're students. We don't we're not faculty. We were thinking possibly like a little forum pages or like a question thing where someone one of the teachers would be like, hey, one of my students is having this problem. How do I help them with this? And they could be like, oh, uh, I personally had this experience as well. This is how. I went through this, or hey, I saw this online. Here is the link to that uh, like Reddit page, and this is what they went through. That way, uh, uh, they, it can stay there for future people. Uh, so if someone has that problem farther down the line, they can go and look at that page and be like, oh, this is how these people went through this, and this is how they did it, and this is how they solved it. Okay. I, one of the one of my favorite things that happened on the faculty um, listserv this last year was like when there was some technology breakdown around a transition to uh, like a new I don't know I don't even know what to call CTC like but there was like uh, there were a lot of issues that none of us knew how to navigate and there were these incredibly helpful threads on the faculty conversations list where we were troubleshooting like student problems in real time it blew up our email like whoa but I think we were all really struggling and needed that, you know, needed that feedback really quickly. So, yeah, and I think that Ariel, you're just bringing that even even further. So thank you. Um, I will take the last two minutes to give um, Alf's, Alf's tips for managing uh, one's feelings on listservs. I'll say um, I am definitely speaking from a position. Uh, Althea, I'm sorry, your microphone doesn't seem to be working right. Dude, thank you, Laura. <laughs> Is that better? <laughs> thank, I know, thank you, thank you. Well, um, Ariel, I gave you a bunch of compliments in case you were wondering. <laughs> um, 
so yeah, so I have some personal ways that I navigate um, in the in the listserv space um, that I am happy to share. But I do want to say that it's coming from a position, my own positionality. I'm a white woman and um, not super used to taking criticism and feedback. So that's like just I am just speaking from that place and what I need to do to be able to stay present in um, spaces that have a lot of conflict. Um, although, Shireen, thank you for the recommendation of the book, Conflict is Not Abuse, because that really helped me sort through some differences between there. So being, you know, helping me stay tolerant of really productive conflict, even when it's hard to be in that space. Um, so here's here are my techniques that work for me. I never check my work email after five o'clock p.m. And if I if I do check it, I don't open the listserv emails because I'm just like, I just expect it to spike my cortisol and I don't want that on my head when I'm trying to sleep. I definitely don't check them on Fridays. And I also, not only do I try to control myself to not check it on Fridays, I try to have something more fun to do on a Friday night than check my email. <laughs> so that's another technique because I don't want to think about it over the weekend if something's blowing up, you know what I mean? And often it's not, but just in case it is, I don't want to know. Uh, I made a rule for myself that I will not respond to an all email thread within an hour of reading something that seemed like it needed my response. That helps me just think and cool down a little bit um, and process. And, and also our emails are FOIAable, which means that they're like state record. And I'm not trying to have my hot takes um, be on state record because they're not that good usually you know um I always when I'm when I'm contributing something that I think might be a little controversial I ask a trusted comrade to look at it first um to just check how I'm coming across um since I want to make sure that I'm communicating as accurately as I can and sometimes I sound different in my head than I sound out my mouth um and uh I also really try to ask myself, is this the kind of thing I need to respond to broadly? Or should I call a person individually or ask for a phone call or just email them? Um, and one of the things that I was really inspired by when I was reading We Do Not Cancel Us, the Adrian Marie Brown book, um, was the idea that like more information is often essential. And so when we're having reactions, it might not be, and this, I think this gets a little bit sure into your um, point. It might not be that we're reacting to the full story and that it might be helpful to get more information before formulating a position and broadcasting this. Okay. I'm getting messages from our facilitators that it's time to wrap it up. So I will leave you with those very incomplete thoughts about how to manage um, one's feeling. And Andrea, the two books that I mentioned are We Will Not Cancel Us and also a book that Shireen recommended, Conflict is Not Abuse. Great, thank you so much. I'll link those books in the COSI guide. I think we have them in the library, but if not, we'll buy copies. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you all so much going to push the end button. Uh, I'm putting this at the top of the top of my list of best cozies. Thank you all for coming. Thank you for contributing your thoughts. Thanks for all, everyone navigating probably some feelings about the topic and, um, and doing it with respect and without tone policing and without shaming and without canceling. Take care, everyone. Thank you so much. Bye.